Welcome, church. Thank you for coming today. I'm just so grateful that you chose to come and study uh, the Word of God together. I can't think of too many things more important than gathering with a group of believers uh, to fellowship, to study God's Word, and to encourage one another. So thank you for being here. We're continuing our series on what we're calling Reset. Today we're discussing resetting your marriage. We really need three or four weeks probably to discuss this topic. It's so big, um, but we'll try to discuss some big points in one session. If you're single, if you're sitting there and you're single or widowed, hang in there. Um, we certainly love you just as much as our married folks, and there's some principles that you can pick up as well. So uh, don't tune me out as we go through this lesson. So marriage, uh, if you've ever been married, uh, you know it's quite a journey. As you, as you meet the one that you, you love, uh, there's all kinds of emotions and, and feelings, and, and you think this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to you. And it can be, and it should be. Um, and then you get married, and sometimes things don't work out quite the way we thought. We thought we knew a person, and then uh, we really get to know that person. Have you ever, have you ever experienced that? Um, just in my first year of marriage, I remember just all the differences learning about between men and women and preferences and gender roles and family background. You know, I like the toilet paper facing backwards and she likes it forward. And there's just all kinds of silly things that you discover um, as you get married. Um, marriage, historically, or an ancient tradition, marriage was about family status. People got married because that secured their status in society. Uh, it wasn't about, I'm attracted to this person or I love that person, it was all about family. It wasn't until the Middle Ages that people actually got married for love. Today in America, I think most people would say, if you asked them, well, why are you getting married or why did you get married? Um, they would say, well, because I wanna be happy. This makes me happy to be with this other person. I don't want to be lonely. Um, but what does the Bible say? Is that the biblical definition of marriage, to just be happy? And actually, it's not. It's not the biblical definition. Uh, in Genesis chapter 2, 24, it says, And a man shall leave his father and mother. He will be joined with his wife, and the two shall become one. There's something so much more, more than just being happy. There's a spiritual um, a joining, not only physical, spiritual as well. Um, there is a new relationship, a new identity that is birthed when you're married. Um, let's read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 2, uh, excuse me, 21 through 33. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle, or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it. Just as Christ cares for the church, and we are members of his body, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Marriage, as defined in the scripture, is a covenant. It's a covenant. It's different than a contract. A contract can be torn up. It's just a piece of paper, but a covenant is a deep commitment. It's a binding promise of future love. When you get married, you have no idea what's gonna happen in the future. You don't know if your spouse will get ill or suffer loss or torment. A covenant is making a commitment that no matter what happens, I'm staying by your side. 
I'm not leaving you. A covenant is a deep, personal, binding, exclusive, permanent, and legal commitment. And that's what the Bible describes as marriage. Godly marriage is all about service. It's about sacrifice. It's about giving more than it is receiving, whether the other person deserves it or not. Um, in this beautiful passage in Ephesians, it shares how Christ, the King, the Son of God, laid down His life. He served us so that we could become more like Him. And Jesus was submitted to the Father and He gave of Himself. And He cleansed us and He purified us. And He's preparing us for a future glory with Him. And it's the same in marriage. He's asking us to submit to one another. He's asking us to help each other become our, our best self, who God really created us to be. You know, you can, um, people say, well, I just, I just care about chemistry. I don't like the commitment. I don't like covenant. And, you know, I get that. Chemistry is nice. But, you know, you can have a one-night stand but not make any commitment or sacrifice for another person. How long will that last? How long can chemistry really last? There's nothing more rewarding and wonderful than being married to a person for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and fully being loved by them and you respecting them. There's nothing quite the same as receiving love from someone you fully respect. And this is the kind of marriage that God's talking about. And God has a plan for marriage. God, God's plan is not, just for, is not just for our happiness, our plan. His plan is for us to become more like Him. And His plan is for us to release His kingdom on earth. This verse in Matthew chapter 18 says, I tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything, you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. There's nothing more powerful than a husband and wife agreeing, coming together and agreeing according to God's will and releasing blessing, releasing destiny, releasing legacy, releasing the power of God to their children, to their communities. But something happens. We get married. Things are hard. Life happens. There's all kinds of stuff that goes wrong. Whether it's external things like illness, children make things hard. Um, our health, work, job, finances. There's all kinds of factors that, that make marriage not work as easily as it did when we were dating. Um, just even gender roles and personality differences. Things start happening and, and there starts to be friction. God's plan and God's will for marriage is that we would be connected. That we would have, most of the time we would be connected and temporarily we would get disconnected because of conflict. But then we would reestablish connection. But many marriages today, the opposite is true. Most of the time is disconnection with momentary times of connection. And so these factors, these forces, external forces, Internal forces like sin, secrets, hurts, habits, they start to destroy our connection. There's also spiritual forces at work. Did you know that the enemy is trying to destroy your marriage if you're married? Or he's trying to destroy relationships if you're not married. He'll, he would love to destroy friendship, community, fellowship. He hates it when people agree. And so the enemy is at work trying to disrupt fellowship and relationship and marriage. I heard a story of a man who, uh, he and his wife had a good marriage, Christian couple. Um, his wife was a wonderful lady. And one morning he went to uh, read his newspaper. And his wife thought he had already read it. And so she threw it away. It ended up in the dumpster outside. And he was so angry. And as he walked outside and he's digging through the trash, his anger is just building. What's wrong with that woman? And, and the thought came in his head, she did that on purpose. She knew 
that I hadn't finished reading the paper. She threw that away on purpose. And as that thought went in his head, he realized he was under a demonic attack. Satan was feeding him lies about his wife. He knew his wife had never done anything malicious. She didn't maliciously intend to harm him. And so he took that thought captive and he just rejected it. He said, I nail that to the cross. Lord, forgive me for partnering with anger. I give that to you, Lord. Give me your love back for my wife. And as he went back in the house, he was fine. There was no, no division. His wife never even knew that he was upset. And this, these things happen all the time. The enemy, Satan, is coming to steal, kill, and destroy our marriages. Another thing that happens in marriage is just communication. Have you ever noticed how difficult it can be to communicate? You think you're saying one thing and your spouse hears another thing? Um, I remember one time Sarah and I were, we had a disagreement and I was, I was upset and I was just emotional and I didn't know what to do. And so I, I said, I need to leave. And what I was saying was, I just need to go on a drive. You know, I just need to go process. And what she heard was, I'm leaving you. I, I'm packing my bags and we're done. And just the communication, uh, all kinds of things happen in our communication. When you get married, you realize um, this is hard. And you have conflict. And conflict is normal and you should expect it. And if, you know, if you're having conflict, it doesn't mean you married the wrong person. It just means you're, you married someone that's different than you. And so conflict is an opportunity to connect. Um, there's all kinds of practical tips to connect. You know, I'll just give you a few quick ones. Um, first of all, when you're talking, um, be a good listener. Always listen first. Um, if there's conflict, if there's frustration, listen for a need. Listen for the need of your spouse. Um, a lot of times when you're having a disagreement, there's a need underneath whatever you're fighting about. So for example, if you're fighting about finances, you know, hey, we're not making it or we're struggling and I don't, I don't agree with the way this is going. Assuming that you're not married to an abusive spender, um, probably the need under there is I need to feel safe I'm not feeling safe, and therefore now we're fighting about finances. If you can listen and get to the need, you'll be able to connect with your spouse easier. Or if you're the one that's frustrated or upset, if you're having a bunch of emotions, take a deep breath and ask the Holy Spirit to show you what is the need that I have that is creating this anxiety or this anger or this fear. There's some need that is being unmet that I need to communicate to my spouse. I'm feeling this need. Um, speak the truth in love. You know, some people are real hard. I'm gonna tell you the truth. I'm gonna tell you like it is. Um, and that's not truth at all if you don't have love. And some people are just loving. Oh, honey, it's okay that you just spent all our vacation money on, on the casino. I forgive you. That's not love either. Love is accompanied by truth and truth is accompanied by love. One way to approach that is if your spouse has hurt you or offended you, it's always good to do the heart work first. Forgive them. Go to God. Get your heart right before you speak the truth. Once you speak the truth and if it's creating a defensive reaction or if it's accusatory, the conversation's over. It's not going to work. Uh, you're going to have to start over, and you might as well stop because you're going to create a lot of damage if you keep going. Um, another simple one, if your spouse is communicating a feeling, don't respond with a fact. Um, facts and feelings don't, don't, don't blend very well. If your spouse is saying, I'm feeling lonely, don't say, hey, you just need to go hang out with your girlfriends. Uh, that's not going to be helpful. Uh, respond with the feeling. Wow. Uh, to help me understand more, uh, I, I'm sad that you're feeling lonely. You see what I'm saying? These are just helpful tips, but these are things that cause disconnection. And the Bible wants us to be connected. And the way the Bible describes connection is through submission. 
And that's what we read in this Ephesians passage. Submit to one another. Submit, what does that mean? It doesn't mean roll over, lay down. It doesn't mean let someone abuse you. It doesn't mean keep quiet, don't share your opinion. It doesn't mean any of those things. It means being powerful, making a choice to be vulnerable, to open your heart, to share your thoughts, to be willing to receive feedback, to be willing to change, to not be stubborn and hold on to your way the whole time. Submission is an active choice to let God and your spouse speak into your life. This verse specifically, just to address it, wives submit to your husbands. Husbands, what that means is if you all don't agree and you believe that what your wife's opinion is either harmful or not correct for her or your family, then you get to be the tie-breaking vote. But it never means you get to do whatever you want. This passage is so clear that husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. He died for the church. He gave everything for the church. And he did not power up. He powered down. He gave it all. And so you are to be seeking ways to add value, to encourage, to bless your wives. Using your headship role should be very rare. I can only think of two times in my marriage where I've had to make a decision that my wife didn't agree with. And it was for her health and her benefit. It was never my selfish interest, like I'm gonna get a steak no matter what you say. It wasn't that. It was for her benefit, and that's the way headship should be. So how do we connect? How do we connect? We build habits, we build connection habits. Have you noticed when you first met your spouse, you talked all the time and you spent time together and you tried to find out everything about them. Now, maybe that's not the same. Go back to those habits. Go on a date. Have dinner with friends. Volunteer together at church or somewhere else. Do healthy things together. Exercise. Build habits that create opportunities for connection. Recommit to submit. Some of you, if the Lord isn't the center of your marriage, ultimately, it's not going to be as successful as it could be. There, there are marriages that don't have God as the center that are good. And what they don't know is they're good because they're following the principles of Jesus. But if you don't have the Lord as the center, He is the North Star. And there will be a day where you are on complete opposite ends. One of you are going north and one of you are going south. And there's no way to reconnect because you don't have the same foundation. And you need the Lord as the foundation. And when He is the center, there will always be a starting line and always be a finish line where you start and end together. And last, partner with the Holy Spirit. God has a plan for your spouse. If you're not married, God has a plan for your relative. He has a plan for your community of friends. Get outside of your own box and begin to ask the Lord, what do you want to do with this person? Who did you create them to be? How can I add value to their life? How can I lay down my life just like Jesus laid down his life for them? What can I do to show them the love of God? How can I encourage them? What are you calling them to? How can I encourage them to take a risk this week? And the Holy Spirit will show you. He'll show you what he wants to do in their life. And one day, by God's mercy and grace, when you stand before the Father, you will be able to look at Jesus and look at your spouse. And you'll say, honey, I always knew this is who you really are. You were created for your king. And because we were together, you're more like him. And I hand you off to our Lord. Thank you for coming today. I want to just close in prayer before you discuss. Lord, I just thank you for this group of people. I pray your amazing blessing on them. I pray you would anoint this discussion. I pray, Lord, for all those who are married in this group, that you would supernaturally open heaven, that they would see that you have a destiny and a calling that is bigger 
than themselves, that you are working mightily, that you have given them authority to release the captives, to bring freedom, to bring healing. And Lord, I just pray that all barriers, anything blocking, creating conflict in a marriage would be exposed and removed in Jesus' name. And I pray for all those in this room that may long to be married or that were married and are not. I just pray for your great will to be done in their life. I pray that they would know deeply how much you love them and how you have a great plan for their life. Thank you, Lord, and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you discuss. We'll see you next time.